So, buenas tardes, hi everyone. I'm Yaakov Tayani, uh, I'm the journalist in Italy and senior strategist at Code for Africa. This is a media NGO working in Africa, niche made number of the interesting initiatives that all talk to the media. Uh, for example, we have initiatives in the real and confined check data verification, investing journey in the knowledge transfer data through mechanism needs. And we also have a team of two years, as you know, it has a personnel at work, clients, and music colleges. So, to, as I said, we work in a number of countries, and mostly in Anglophone and Arctophone Africa. And I am personally based in Rome, so I work a little bit like a pitch between Europe and Africa. Most of my colleagues are based in the, in the kind of physics of the map. And our uh, aim, uh, a specific Cape Town, so often. So the subject of this quick workshop is looking into the impact of some of my favorite projects in the folks from Africa. Uh, the idea that you can replicate them in your geology or with your communities. The reason why I'm talking about impact is because impact is the main ingredient for fundraising and to get on, catch new grants. So it's super important to see if we can be about it. So I would need data work, especially in war we tax and the non gossip organizations. And then finally, I'm going to share some learning resources for you that you can use when you are back home. Uh, and, uh, for example, I created a uh, uh, Kafka that you can feel as you break stop with your kid before you stop writing them all so it's And I'm very sure that we did. Let's so start the showcase of projects. Uh, this is actually uh, one of the first projects I had the chance to work on. It's called the Majorless Files. Um, it is basically a uh, first national data journalism project focusing on uh, the uh, migration flows in between Africa and Europe. Uh, a bunch of data journalists joined forces, I was part of that team, about 10 years ago to merge together a lot of different fragmented data sets that were published in multiple languages in Europe. And these data sets in particular were uh, counting the deaths of migrants in certain portions of the European frontiers. We, as a team of data journalists, decided to stitch these data sets together in order to provide the big picture for the first time. Um, the project was quite successful, despite we had a very small grant. We were just uh, you know, a team of young freelancers. We had a, about $10,000 as a grant for this project. But we managed to publish a, a, a campaign of stories in multiple languages, their data set that you can still find online on, uh, on this website. But most importantly, uh, this project created uh, a long-lasting impact. So the impact that this project created is not just about publishing the stories and raising awareness, but it was used by the United Nations to create another database that is now still living, and it's called the Missing Migrants uh, Database, which is quite famous and you can still find it online. And they mentioned the migrants' files in their papers. They basically recognized the, the inspiration that our project created to them. So one thing is having a database like this made by uh, journalists who only have one grant. Another thing is having the United Nations creating, you know, uh, a long-lasting open data portal on the same topic. So, it's an example on how a data journalism project can be turned into uh, a long-lasting social data impact project. And this is another example of the uh, open data portal that was used by both journalists and civic society organizations. So most of you may know uh, Medicine Sans Frontières or Doctors Without Borders, Doctores Sin Fronteras. It's, a, it's an NGO uh, that provides free healthcare and assistance to anyone in need in war zones or also in situations like the Mediterranean Sea where a lot of people try to cross the, the border and unfortunately there are shipwrecks and, and other problems. 
So they had a, a massive uh, CSV file, nobody was using it. They came to us and we created an open data portal uh, for them with an interactive map where you can actually click around, see the routes of the ships that rescued migrants in the city. This thing was used by thousands of journalists all over the world. And it's an example of how an open data portal can be used by journalists but in, in multiple countries who are interested in that topic. So that's another kind of impact that I had in mind. Uh, another project I want to mention is a combination of uh, data journalism, data visualization, and data trainings in the Congo Basin around the issue of deforestation. So Lungs of the Earth is a project that Code for Africa made in, uh, uh, in collaboration with the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting and uh, Global Forest Watch, which you may know. And the idea was to not just take the data and, and, and tell stories with it, or like hiring a journalist and doing a story. It was mostly about training African journalists to use Global Forest Watch data, to understand the data, to re-visualize, to filter, to incorporate it into their storytelling, and then get them published the stories. So it's an example of how training can generate uh, a long-lasting impact more just than having a story published as a one-off. So this was a set of uh, training sessions and mentorship uh, uh, connections between uh, data journalists from the Global North and also from Africa and journalists from the Congo Basin region, both in English and, fr and French. And they basically started using this data uh, for their storytelling. So this thing is still going on. Some of them are still using the data of Global Forest Watch after a few years. And actually, one of the journalists who uh, took part in this project won an international award. We won the stories, so we, we were proud of that. Last example I have, before I move into the more practical session, uh, Mapping Makoko, which is uh, a data journalism project that was turned into uh, a mapping project that was turned into a urban development project that was turned into a research project. So it's kind of it's interesting to see this metamorphosis happening. Uh, it is basically um, a drone mapping exercise in Lagos, Nigeria, in a place called Makoko, where there are over 300,000 people living in, uh, in dire conditions and extreme poverty. That place, until Code for Africa decided to uh, map it together with the local community, was completely unmapped. Uh, basically, you could go on Google Maps and find a blank, blank spot in there. Uh, we uh, decided to work with the local community to, to see basically uh, whether they were interested in mapping it. We kind of created a dialogue with them. We met with the local chiefs of Makoko. Because you can't just go into Macomb and fly a drone, but that's not possible, it's not allowed. You have to create a trust relationship with the people who live there. So we did that, actually. Uh, I want to show you this picture. Is that guy there is, a, is my former colleague, John Romizelle, who was supposed to be here uh, at the conference. So I just wanted to, you know, make a tribute to him. He couldn't come because of a visa problem. He's from Nigeria, and he had a, a lot of problems at the airport. So just hi <laughs> if he sees us. Uh, but he, he was the protagonist of this project. So he kind of uh, trained the local community in Makoko to fly drones, to collect open data, label uh, places uh, on open street maps. And why is this project so interesting? Because it, it started out as a data journalism project. We, want to make, we wanted to make a data-driven journalism campaign around Makoko, and we wanted to collect geographic data to tell the story. So we did that, and we got a lot of attention from CNN, BBC, a few others, uh, including Nigerian media outlets, like The Guardian Nigeria. But the thing is that this project kind of turned into an alive uh, uh, being, like something that started having its own life, because, for example, it was used by uh, the University of Lagos uh, to kind of run uh, randomized sample research for, uh, uh, to go against COVID-19 in Makoko, because there was no geographic data about Makoko. 
So it was impossible for them to understand how people were behaving in order to, I don't know, to counter the, the pandemic. So they used our geographic data to do uh, medical research. Uh, then also, this data, uh, the geographic data of Makoko, uh, was used to uh, kind of map the water sources in Makoko, and then some people went there to collect samples of water and see if the quality was good or not. In some cases, the, there was metal in the water, so that's another interesting impact story. Um, then what else? Well, knowledge transfer was a component here, because the people were, had the, the chance to learn how to map with drones and uh, open data kit. They never had the chance, like people living in, in, uh, in very difficult conditions never had the chance before to do that, and they did it with, through us. Um, and then, yeah, well, okay, it got the Sigma Awards, so one of the first Nigerian projects to get the Sigma Awards, which was, you know, boosted the team morale. Um, and we believe that this approach can be replicated anywhere when there is an unmapped uh, place. I'll skip this, and now I'll talk about some of the tactical moves that you can have or do to uh, get one of the grants. So, first of all, think of the impact, like spend days and days, days, weeks, thinking of the potential impact of your project, and make that your compass. So that, that will be your compass. You need to be impact obsessed. Without that, I mean, you can get a grant without that, but first of all, it's a wasted opportunity. And second, uh, you have uh, fewer chances to get the grant if you don't think about impact. So. You, you can use my examples as a way to start thinking about impact if you never, have never done that. Or you can basically go and read some of these resources and see other projects that won uh, grants before. Get inspired by them and look into their impact. Second, uh, each geography has a list of donors who are interested in uh, the use of data for social good. So my suggestion is to create your own donor base. It can be as simple as a Notion file, for example, with a table where you start listing all the donors who could be approached, you know, to, to raise some money for, for your projects. And in the previous slides, there are some databases that you can use to start. Um, so, if you've never done that before, you need to create a relationship with the donors. So how do you do that? You start with a pilot project, so you don't start uh, applying for a million dollars all, all of a sudden. You start with like small projects, and then you build your portfolio. You try to meet with your donors in person, if you can, like in a conference, for example, or if that's not possible, you meet online and you try to build like a trust relationship. Because that, that's gonna help you a lot. Um, then you, you kind of match, uh, match make here. So you, first of all, you map the needs of your audience, of your communities. You map the donors, so you create your donor base. And then you also try to link all these with project ideas. And then in the intersection of these three sets, there's going to be your winning project. Think of data use. I think one of the most interesting inputs I'm getting here is how people think of data use. So a lot of the data is uh, archived on an open data portal or worse, in PDF files. Nobody is using it. So I think the, the notion of impact is closely related to the notion of data use. So think of Map Makoko, for example. That data, the, the map, mapping data we collected with drones, was used by researchers, was used by government, well, not by governments, but we hope the government will use it for, you know, to improve the living conditions of the people. It was used by medical researchers and by journalists. So ensure that the data that you use will be used, or the data that you collect will be used. Invest a lot of energy into data use, because that's where the impact will come from. Um, this is something I've already mentioned, so I can skip it. And this is the grant canvas that I've created for anyone who wants to play with these ideas on a Miro board. It's free, obviously, it's open source, meaning as you, can clone, <laughs> you can clone it and reuse it with your team. And I have some screenshots here 
of the main questions that you're going to ask you and your team as you brainstorm about your grant project. These are questions that any donor will ask you if you apply for a grant. So for example, uh, describe your project in three sentences, so, sort of elevator pitch. You need to be able to explain your project idea in three sentences to anyone, not to your colleague, but to, I don't know. I do it with my uncles, for example. You know, I go there and say, look, what do you think about this? <laughs> and test my ideas. That's a way to do it. But be sure that you can summarize it in three sentences, uh, map your audience. Dissemination plan will amplify data use. So working with media is a way to do it. Um, and then create a consortium of partners because, you know, it, most of the times the uh, most impactful projects come from multiple entities joining forces and accessing larger grants. So some grants can last years. They require a, a consortium of partners. That means that you need to cultivate your relationships around the world or in your region. Um, Another section of the grant canvas is mostly about project management. So you have a budget breakdown, so how do you spend the money? This is very straightforward. Team organogram, you're going to have a team organogram for your project. It can't be just a flat line of people doing anything or everything all together. Especially if the grant is a bit larger, then you need a little bit of structure. Uh, so think of the organogram. It can be even three people, you know, it doesn't have to be 25 people. But uh, who's responsible for project management? Who's responsible for the bureaucracy of the grant? Because some grants come with bureaucracy. Who does what? Uh, so that, that is important. And then the timeline, obviously. You know, there are milestones that you need to kind of meet and, and cross during the project implementation phase. So you can kind of sketch them out into this section of the mirror board. And then these other interesting one. This is probably my favorite. Success indicators, so how do, you success, uh, how do you measure your success? I, I came across projects that didn't know what success means. They, they just did it. Well, that's fine, you, know, you can try and experiment. But it's, it's always best to know when you can declare that you've been successful. So success indicators, um, novelty. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, so um, if somebody else in another geography has done something similar, just reach out to them, ask them if they are available to share their methodology or their source code or their websites. Um, so what, what you have to do there is basically mapping the landscape and see what's already published by anyone in the world, also in other languages. So it takes a little bit of time. It's a research task. And then ethical concerns. So like data privacy, uh, AI and ethics, uh, um, can my data be weaponized against the community? So a lot of the questions we got, for example, on Map Makoko is what if this data is used by, you know, real estate players? Uh, we were actually grilled on that and, and that's, that's important. So be, be aware of the potential ways that this, your project can backfire on the community. Uh, our answer on the real estate question is, we know that who want to exploit that place has already the data to do that. Because it's, you can extract it from satellites. What we wanted to do, we wanted to democratize access and we, want, we wanted them to use the data to state their own existence, the community existence, because they, they were neglected, basically. So that was our point. But yeah, you need to create a dialogue uh, within your team and within potentially your partners and anyone who wants to join the conversation. And then this is a theory of change section. If you want to know more about it, I don't have time, I know. So if you want to know more about it, you can come to me. But it's just a way to kind of uh, map out the ways you uh, turn activities into outputs, outputs into outcomes, and outcomes into long-term goals. Some donors require that. So you can do it in this canvas <laughs> board if you want. Other links that you can use. Uh, and then questions. And if you want the slides, you can find them there. And these are my contacts. So uh, I'm just summarizing it all. Thank you. Preguntas? <laughs> Preguntas or uh, questions?
You can ask your questions in Spanish, it's fine, if, if you prefer. Okay. Yeah, I will. Okay, um, so how long Map Macoco took to be implemented? Uh, un total de un año. Sí. Uh, tenemos tres grants, tuvimos tres grants, una del Pulitzer Center, Pulitzer Centers on Crisis Reporting, una de HOTOSM, Humanitarian Open Street Map, very small one but key for us to kickstart the project. And then, I think, and then CFA contributed with some money also. So we kind of match, match, match funded. That's, that's it, yeah. Pregunta? Sí. Ahora te, te digo. So the question is, uh, what kind of uh, funds we can use in Latin America? And uh, what, what type of project? So type of project, any project, I believe. There, there's no one type of project in my mind. That it depends on your area. I think, uh, for example, if you want to approach this business from a journalism point of view, you can look into the uh, media funds out there, like Pulitzer Center, for example. They fund the Latin Americans to do projects. And actually, their grants are really good. ICFJ. Uh, as, a, as, as a former ICFJ fellow, uh, it's an absolutely good opportunity to look into. And then if you open my, my slides, there is a, one slide with a list of links. Each link is a database of donors. So you go there and filter the country you want to look into or the region, and you start from there. But you need to map the donors, so it's actually a good question. Yeah, yes. Yes. Well, I mean, uh, you saw the organogram there, right? So the data scientists and technologists, they are key. They are key because they, they know how to use the technology. But it, this is a multidisciplinary effort. So you, work, you get to work with project managers, periodistas, journalists, uh, I don't know, activists in some cases, researchers. So how do you do that as a data scientist? Uh, I think building relationships, so I think you're in the right place now, like build relationships with people you can join forces with, and then kind of embrace the chaos that comes with multidisciplinary work. And if, if you can't go to conferences in person, then you can join online communities. Um, there are many, I think CSVConf is a good example of that, but there are many others that you want to look into. Uh, if you want to democratize your data science, I think you need to look into data visualization a little bit. And there are data visualization communities out there that you can uh, approach. And if you grab me outside, I'll, I'll give you some examples. Yeah. Well, thanks for listening, yeah? Thank you. Thank you.